All right, Michael, calling all black pastors. Let's talk more about the fight for justice for Ahmaud Arbery. In just hours, the testimony resumes in the trial of three white men who chased down, stalked, then shot and killed the 25-year-old. If today's anything like what we witnessed in the courtroom last week, well, it's going to be another triggering day for so many of us. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in, was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family trying to influence a jury in this case. I will follow up with a more specific motion on Monday, uh, putting that and those concerns in the proper context. And my apologies to anyone who might have inadvertently been offended. That's the defense attorney, Kevin Goff. Good morning to you, Candace Kelly, our, 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 our top legal mind. The context, <laughs> Candace, seems to be, well, the context is racism, okay? That was a racist statement, racist thoughts provoked it. He apologized, as you heard there. Um, it, by definition, it was an apology. Uh, too little, too late. Uh, that's mm. the question, Candace. What say you about how, and I know we touched on this a little bit last week, about how the court handled this and what the fallout will be? Well, the court handled this in a way that was expected. They really didn't get into the weeds because this is attorney that did not go through the process of filing an emotion because this is what attorneys do when they have a concern, when they want the judge to act. Uh, on this level, they file a motion. And so this attorney, Attorney Goff, said that he was going to file a motion today in terms of these quote-unquote black pastors that were coming into the courthouse and that were, you know, possibly going to be outside and distract the jury in some way, shape, or form. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. He said that he would file a motion today. But I think after the weekend, especially after all that we've been hearing, the pastors who are gearing up to come down this weekend by the but this week by the droves, I sense that he's going to have a lot of reservation about filing this motion. That really doesn't make sense because, like you said, we've spoken about this, and we know that this is a courtroom sharing that is open to the public, and that includes pastors. I do want to pull up uh, our colleague Dre Clark, who, with precision. Uh, got Mr. Goff outside the courtroom and did proceed to follow up with him because he also said that members of the black press were somehow unfair to uh, his case. Uh, but, but let's talk about Ben Crump. Uh, he's called on a hundred pastors to be at the courthouse this week to pray. And I want to know if you think that's going to have an effect on the case because what was not a distraction, and the judge said nobody even really noticed that the Reverend Al Sharpton was inside the courtroom last week before <clears throat> Mr. Goff said what he said. It could become one, I suppose, but how will this play out in court? I think that this will come up once again to make sure that whatever is going on with the pastors and those who are supporting this case outside remains under control. It's okay for an attorney just to remind the judge about what's going on outside and to make sure that everybody is taken into consideration. But the truth is, and Dre will confirm this, is that these jurors go in a back way. They don't necessarily see the pastors. I mean, it's inevitable that they would hear that they are out there, but they are supposed to be impartial jurors, properly selected, based upon uh, making decisions based upon the evidence. So at this point, unless there's a large commotion or unless there's something that is really distracting besides uh, quiet, peaceful protesting or support of the Arbery family, this really shouldn't affect, once again, what's going on in the inside. They can even go inside in droves. If a dozen of them want to sit and take the role that is reserved for the family, they can do that. They just can't wear any buttons or show anything that shows that they are in support or they're, uh, uh, they are representing any type of organization. All right, well, just because it was so good, Candace, I do want to go now to that footage um, from last week where Dre Clark uh, caught up with Kevin Goff outside the courtroom. Okay, we don't have it, but I assure you it was that good. It, oh, it was um, good. The I'll last start. witness, it was, it was just delicious, and I'll revisit. I'll make a meme out of it if I want to. Um, the last <laughs> witnesses we heard from on Friday, um, they shed light, really, how the prosecution is doing. The previous testimony given by the defendants, um, that has hurt them a great deal. And by testimony, I mean the, what they uttered on the scene and in the days after. Can you talk about that? 
Yes, indeed. And this has really been key to this case because all along, for example, William Bryan said that he was just a bystander, happened to shoot this video, and he was hoping that justice would be gotten for the um, Arbery family. That's what he was saying at the beginning. But now we have testimony. We've got this previous recorded testimony that's coming into evidence. We've heard from Brian. We've heard from the other two defendants. And this has really been a, a, a wonderful gift for the prosecution. On Friday, we left off with special agent in charge, Jason Sechrist. And he was a guy who said that he had interaction with William Bryan after the death of Ahmaud Arbery, the shooting. And he asked him questions about why he was chasing after Ahmad. And he said, well, you know, I just had an instinct. I had an instinct that he was doing something wrong. Um, I, I, I thought that he might have shot somebody, potentially. I thought that he might have stolen something. But again, no concrete evidence. And this is what we, were, we are getting from those pre-recorded sessions, as well as what they said right after the shooting, that they didn't have any reason to follow Ahmad Arbery. There was no evidence that he had stolen anything. There was no evidence that he had a weapon. Even William Bryan, through the special agent Jason Seacrest on Friday, said to him right after the shooting, I, I really didn't know anything about him. I just decided to jump in and uh, record this. And I actually cornered him at one point or another, basically confessing to all of the, the things that they are on trial for. So if, if, if this week is a continuation of last, what we've been hearing is this pre-recorded testimony, and I think that we're going to hear more of that. Certainly, uh, wins for the prosecution all throughout last week, Sharon. You know the enormous privilege, white privilege, and and sheer racism that's on display here. It makes me wonder and ask again about whether we need to just put it on the record quite plainly instead of just talking about quote assumptions assumptions mm. which you, in your legal view may do you Thank think you, what sir. you said yesterday was was racist in any way what i say in court i say in court if you want to talk to me outside of court we can but we can't do it right now do you okay? plan on apologizing to ahmaud arbery's family for suggesting that black pastors shouldn't be allowed to sit next to them in the courtroom i'm sorry are you asking me what is your question again i'm asking you do you plan to apologize to the Arbery family for suggesting that black pastors not be allowed to sit next to them in the courtroom? I guess you'll have to watch the proceedings this morning. All right. So you plan to address it inside the courtroom this morning? Yes, we'll see. You know, the thing about uh, saying racist things, Candace, is it's very difficult to process <laughs> in your mind how to defend them. And so oh, I yes. wonder if, again, this jury's not sequestered, Candace. They go home at night, so remind me how you think, and I know they get instructions, how you think this will, you got to like the people who are speaking to you, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to like them. And I, I even think that his display, just his demeanor in court, is really unlikable. I don't think he's making a lot of friends on the jury, and I think that we knew that during jury selection process. His disposition, his very Southern privilege disposition, I'm not sure how that bodes in terms of the jury. Of course, let's think about this jury that is made up of 11 white people and one black person. So maybe he is, quote unquote, playing to his base. We, we really don't know exactly how these mm. people think. So it's kind of hard to really say. But as you said, this is someone who, when he was speaking with Dre, he was not as confident as he was inside of the courtroom. He was a little sheepish and, sheepish, and as you said, you might say racist things, but then when you're put in a position where you have to defend them and then are ultimately forced to apologize like he was, a much different story. And that's what we saw. We saw the remix of this attorney after he had a little bit of time to think about what he had done wrong. As we know, he gave an apology whether or not he will have that motion about this ridiculous idea that no black pastors are allowed in the courtroom, I think not. I don't think we will be seeing a motion. I think we will get right into the witnesses today. Yeah, we, we don't need more from him. As, as DJ Kelly, another one, okay? He needs to just sit down and, and <laughs> let the case play out. Uh, Candace, thank you. I know you'll stay with us this morning. Thank you for your insight, as always.